Good afternoon. My name is Mads Walensky. I am a professor of philosophy here at the University of San Diego and the director of USD's Center for Ethics, Economics, and Public Policy. Over the last 12 months, we've seen a lot of high profile incidents involving controversial speakers that have been invited to college campuses across the country. From the shouting down of Charles Murray at Middlebury College, to the riots surrounding Milo Yiannopoulos' planned visit to Berkeley, to just earlier this week with the interruption of philosopher Christina Hoff Summers' speech at Lewis and Clark College. And many argue that these incidents are merely the most visible signs of a much larger phenomenon with threats to free speech involving not only invited speakers, but individual students, student organizations, and faculty members as well. Is free speech under threat at America's college campuses? How important a value is free speech in a university setting devoted to the pursuit of truth? How should administrations and students respond to speakers with which they disagree or whose views they find to be morally repugnant? Are there some ideas, some words, some arguments that should simply be off limits? These are just some of the questions which we'll be exploring in this afternoon's debate. And I'm glad and honored that here to help us explore them, we have two eminently qualified debaters. Greg Lukianoff is the president of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, an organization that litigates on behalf of students, student organizations, and faculty members whose rights to free speech, association, and due process have been violated. He is the author of the 2012 book, Unlearning Liberty, Campus Censorship and the End of American Debate, and the soon to be released book, The Coddling of the American Mind, How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure, co-authored with Jonathan Haidt. Stanley Fish is the Davidson Kahn Distinguished University Professor of Humanities and Law at Florida International University. He is one of the country's leading public intellectuals and the author of more than 200 scholarly publications and books, including pathbreaking works on the ideas of John Milton, and most relevant for this debate, two eyed books on the ideas of free speech and the American Academy. The first provocatively titled, There's No Such Thing as Free Speech and It's a Good Thing Too. The second, directed I think mostly at faculty members like me, titled, Save the World on Your Own Time. Our format tonight is as follows. We will have two 20 minute presentations from each of our debaters, followed by 20 minutes of moderated conversation followed again by 25 minutes of open question and answer period with the audience. Uh, if you'd like to uh, participate uh, virtually in the debate, we can, uh, you can tweet uh, at, with the hashtag CEP debate. Uh, we're being live streamed right now, so you might find yourself chatting with people not even in this room. Uh, the video of the debate will be online on our YouTube page afterwards. Uh, and we do ask uh, that after the debate uh, is concluded at some point, um, you take a moment to fill out our survey uh, at the URL indicated on the screen there. Just let us know what you think, what you'd like to see uh, in future events. So without any further ado, I turn things over to Greg Lucan. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, <laughs> I was actually originally wanted to only uh, do 10 minutes of opening remarks, maybe even five minutes of opening remarks. Uh, but Stanley recommended we do 20, and therefore I'm going to subject you to the entire history of freedom of speech on campus, at least all that I know of it. Um, I started at FIRE in 2001, and uh, so I'm going to refer to this as free speech under attack on, on college campuses. So I'm going to have to gonna go fairly quickly um, uh, to, to, to cover all of it. So I refer to this section as prehistory, um, and what I mean by prehistory is before I have personal experience with what's going on on campus. But the main thing you need to know about free speech on college campus prehistory before 2001 is that it was very well established that free speech is very well protected on American college campuses. Now, of course, there's the private public distinction. Private colleges are bound by their promises. Uh, actually, in the state of California, though, um, non-sectarian schools are bound by the First Amendment. That's due to all this particular law in California. Um, so it wouldn't apply to USD. But since 1957, um, uh, if not earlier, 
the Supreme Court has found that free speech um, and academic freedom are strongly protected on campuses. Now, I'm gonna show you a slide to convey how strongly. This is a cartoon for which a student was uh, kicked out of school in the uh, early 1970s. It's a cartoon of cops raping the Statue of Liberty and the goddess of justice. The Supreme Court found this unquestionably protected on the basis of the fact that offense alone cannot uh, make something unprotected speech at an American university. So it's very strong. It is not uh, subject to being overruled by someone merely being offended. So I'm gonna get into now the phases I've seen in my career. So starting in 2001, uh, it was very consistent that the kind of case, if you were gonna get in trouble on a college campus, it wasn't because faculty wanted to shut you up, it wasn't because students wanted to shut you up, it was generally because of uh, administrators. It was, it was administrative overreach time and time again. Now this is a case at uh, up north at Mod uh, Modesto Junior College where a student who was trying to hand out copies of the US Constitution on September 17th, also known as Constitution Day, was told that he was not allowed to hand out copies of the Constitution without prior advance notice, and, he, and even then he would be limited to a tiny free speech zone on campus. You don't need to be a First Amendment lawyer to know that this is laughably unconstitutional, and this was more typical of the kind of cases I was dealing with. Now, some of them do fit the um, I have a right not to be offended scenario, uh, but a lot of these cases don't necessarily work out how um, people would think they would, they would work out given sort of stereotypes of political correctness on campus. My very first letter at fire um, that I sent was on behalf of a professor at University of New Mexico um, who on 9-11 joked, anybody who can blow up the Pentagon has my vote. Now this is a professor who was known for being really acerbic, for being very funny in his class, um, and he immediately apologized for it. Um, but he chose not to fight any action taken against him, and by that summer he was out of a job. Um, he actually, yeah, I got a rare um, look into the future uh, from this professor. He wrote a paper um, that uh, summer saying, I should have listened to fire. I should have actually fought because uh, free speech was actually on my side. So, and then of course there are speech codes, um, campus speech codes very roughly defined as codes that violate what would be protected speech um, under the First Amendment. Um, and so some examples of this, this one is actually still in place at uh, University of West Alabama. It bans harsh text messages or emails. Now hopefully, and as the years go by, I find that people understand less and less what's objectionable about this, because it's like, that sounds nice. Um, every single one of you in this office Oh, sorry, in this room could be found guilty of violating this because it's merely someone's interpretation of whether or not it's, it's a harsh text message or email. Um, it allows for massive abuse and you should not trust administrators with these kind of powers. Now, a code that's popped up twice and had to be uh, struck, uh, struck down once at University of Connecticut and then popped up again many years later at, universe, at, at Drexel University in Philadelphia banned the use of derogatory jokes, um, inconsiderate uh, jo jokes, and inappropriately directed laughter. The fact that this literally popped up twice um, over the course of 15 years is absolutely uh, stunning to me. So in, back in 2007, when we got our first serious data set of speech codes, we found that over, uh, around 75% of universities that we surveyed, and we based them on the most popular schools in the country and also the top 100 liberal arts colleges according to US News and World Reports, we found that about 75% of colleges at the time maintained laughably unconstitutional speech codes. Now, I'm gonna come back to this example, but to give you another ex idea of what, kind, what we mean by speech uh, code, these are some free speech zones. Um, in the bottom corner is uh, the very <laughs> sad um, uh, Texas Tech University free speech gazebo, uh, 20 foot wide area on campus, where we, <laughs> which was the only place where students were allowed uh, to protest or hand out materials. I had a friend who has a degree in math from MIT, uh, do the, the dimensional analysis on this, and if God forbid all 28,000 students wanted to exercise their free speech rights at once at Texas Tech University, they would have to be crushed down to the density of uranium-238. <laughs> and he was deadly serious. He was like, no, no, that's about the density. Um, there's this, the free speech swamp at University of Hawaii at Hilo where students were trying to protest the NSA or hand out copies of the Constitution. Um, there's this one where students were trying to, uh, at the University of Cincinnati, see the big green uh, pin. They were trying to pass out uh, a, a ballot initiative. Um, they were trying to get signatures for a ballot initiative that was two days. 
um, in the future, and they were told that they would be arrested. These were students at University of Cincinnati if they were seen, quote unquote, walking around campus um, for trying to, uh, to petition the government for redress of grievances, which might sound uh, familiar to some of you. And the single saddest looking <laughs> free speech zone I have ever seen is Blinn College in um, uh, Texas. That's that one oh, in the corner. The speech zone is not, uh, not that entire vast area you see in the picture, but just the two squares on either side of that sad looking bulletin board. Uh, we actually have to uh, go into court in order to get that, uh, the university to back down on that one. Now, again, these are not hard cases. So now there's phase two. Uh, phase two is when you start seeing the Department of Education come out with um, definitions of harassment that actually necessarily required punishing protected speech. Uh, this was something that university had claimed my entire career, that the Department of Education was making them pass these ridiculous codes, which was, of course, a ridiculous thing to say. But then, unfortunately, um, starting in 2011 and 2013, you start having guidance coming out of the Department of Education um, that required, frankly, a ridiculously unconstitutional national speech code. They removed all the protections um, that were normally uh, around harassment and just said if it's unwelcome, con uh, unwelcome verbal conduct, also known as speech of a sexual nature, whether it's offensive to an average person or not, if it's just subjectively offensive to you, these are, this eviscerates the normal protections uh, put around what, what harassment is defined as. And understand that in a lot of states, this is immediately applied to 17 different categories. Mo Montana, for example, applies it to uh, speech that is unwelcome based on politics. <laughs> Which is like, okay, so you've just passed a national speech code that basically means any opinion you have potentially could be under threat. And that's the way it has worked out. Um, so North, anyone familiar with the case of Laura Kipnis? Practically nobody. On one hand, one up. That's amazing. Okay. So Laura Kipnis is a feminist professor at Northwestern University. Thank you, Stanley. At Northwestern University. She wrote an article that was critical of overreach um, from, by Title IX. And she found herself uh, in, a, in a secret Title IX investigation for violating Title IX, for being critical of the overreach of Title IX. <laughs> she then wrote, and she wrote, she wrote an article about it. They abandoned the, uh, once it went public, they abandoned the, the whole shenanigans. Then she wrote a book about it, and they launched an investigation about her again, um, which we're currently in, the, uh, currently in the middle of fighting. So it ended, ended up having a lot of interesting ramifications. And by the way, it's not, weird in my experience that even a, a law passed to protect women is consistently being used against women, often feminist women. So a case that we're currently in litigation at right now is a professor um, uh, here at Louisiana State University, Terry Buchanan, who was fired under the blueprint standard. We're still in litigation about that. And it's just kind of crazy that we're that we would even have to go to court on, on some of this stuff. So OK, phase three. This is when people really started paying attention. And this, I have to admit, roils me a little bit because the media didn't pay a lot of attention to what was going on on campus until it was the students themselves um, that were demanding people be disinvited, um, that uh, you know, demanding trigger warnings or microaggression uh, training and that kind of stuff. And it was kind of weird because once it sort of better fit a conservative stereotype of what the situation on campus was, it, w it suddenly got better coverage both from you know, Fox News, but also from MSNBC, which was a little bit strange that it, that it took that happening. But it is true, disinvitations went up. Disinvitations, as in and what we define dis disinvitations are, are attempts to get speakers disinvited because you don't like their point of view. Now, what you see here is a graph of uh, right versus left. Um, people on the right demanding that someone not speak on your campus and people from the left uh, not, not speaking on your campus. And if you could look at it, you can see that it's actually not that different from left to right um, on campus until the media really started noticing it. And so fire started noticing it after 2012. And as you can see, 2016 was the highest point we've seen in disinvitation pushes in, in, in my career. So that is an attitude change. Prior to 2013, 2014, the single best constituency for free speech on college campus was not professors, it definitely wasn't administrators, it certainly wasn't university presidents, it was students, and that has changed. Um, this is where you first start hearing stories about uh, microaggression policies, like the one at UCLA that lists things um, like uh, America's a melting pot. I believe the most qualified person should get the job, uh, should get the job as a form of aggression against the oppressed. Now, this is 
I understand to some degree, because this is kind of sexy stuff, and it is a little strange, but I was used to much more severe uh, punishments um, than this. Um, so then there's what, what we're, when uh, we wrote, wrote our first article with John Haidt, um, it was one of the reasons why we wrote it was because we saw this big spike in attempts to medicalize the excuses for censorship, that essentially they were using models of trauma, models of PTSD to say that we can't have the speech on campus anymore because it's medically harming. So we wrote an article called Coddling the American Mind, a title I've never liked um, and still don't like. But it was basically saying that not only is this wrong, not only does this misunderstand the science of trauma and the science of, uh, of the basic psychology, I, wrote, I co-wrote it with a, um, a famous psychologist, John Haidt, um, that it gets, the, uh, it gets psychology exactly backwards. That essentially if you tell somebody that they're very frail and that they're never going to recover again if they hear something uh, that, that really offends them, that is doing them a massive psychological disservice. And it's not something that any psychologist would ever actually tell you. So basically what we were seeing was this disempowerment of students. And essentially they were being told um, that the reason why a lot of the censorship was happening was partially because people from K through 12 or other administrators were more or less telling them that if someone comes and really says something that challenged your point of view, you could be permanently harmed. That's insulting and it's wrong in our opinion. And also the science backs us up. Now, 2015, 2015 protests really captured a lot of attention. Um, and it's partially because it was really the first time in my career that there was a very strong uh, racial component to what was going on in the protests. And the protests themselves, I was really excited to see a lot of them because I'm a First Amendment guy, I love protests. But what was distressing was that in, in a substantial number of the cases, they weren't just asking for you know, more money to the departments that they cared about. They were asking for particular faculty to be fired for what they said, staff to be fired for what they said. And in this case, asking for the student newspaper to be defunded because they published an article of someone who was critical of Black Lives Matter. Now, if you were to read the article, um, you know, it was probably about as mainstream as you're going to get on, on, uh, with, with that point of view. It was someone trying to respectfully say that they actually dis they disagree. And what we didn't know is this was going to lead to, um, this was the first step in a very uh, kind of intense couple of months of protests, some of which were great, some of which were not so great. <laughs> um, does anybody remember this person? Okay, so this is Melissa Click. This is the person who asked for, uh, let's get some muscle over here when, God forbid, a student tried to cover the protests at University of Missouri at Mizzou. Um, she was a communications professor. Uh, shouldn't be telling people to get muscle to get rid of student reporters. So phase five. Um, <laughs> there, are, there are six phases. Or are, are there seven? I'll, I'll find out as I go. So phase five is very new. Um, and if you'll notice, these phases are getting closer and closer together. <laughs> They're like contractions. They're just getting, um, and what, it's one of the reasons why I, we're real, I think people are really noticing this. And for the first time in my career, um, 2017 was the first time I saw real violence on campus. And in working on the book, um, I uh, had to watch a lot of videos of, of, of the you know, so-called Milo riots. And they were a lot worse than I thought. I went to Stanford. I uh, lived in the Bay Area for a long time. I went to Burning Man seven times. I know like a lot of the kind of people who would have been in the anti-Milo crowd. But the idea of taking it out on people who were there to see the show was not what I was expecting. And they're very lucky nobody got killed at that. This includes hitting someone with a, um, a flagpole right across the top head, big, big pool of blood. Um, and what's amazing is a lot of, some of the students who were assaulted, these were people who didn't like Milo. <laughs> They actually were very much on record just trying to see what would actually happen. And they were assaulted, you know, nonetheless, because that's what happens when things get out of control. So incidents across the country include uh, the shutting down of Heather McDonald, um, which uh, happened at, I think, uh, Claremont McKenna College, where it was actually physically, where students actually physically um, a blocked entrance to her speech so it couldn't go on. There was, uh, of course, the incident in Middlebury, where Allison Stanger was badly hurt uh, while trying to defend Charles Murray, <laughs> um, the right to speak on our campus, which is just the one laughing, because Allison Stanger does not agree with Charles Murray on anything. She invited him to 
her, him to Middlebury so she could debate him. But she ended up uh, having to go to the hospital with concussion. She has injuries that she suffered from this day, to this day because one of the protesters uh, grabbed her hair and pulled her down to the ground. Um, and uh, once again, like with the uh, Milo riots, I think, uh, I think maybe two people were arrested for the Milo riots. And in this case, I'm not sure if the person who actually insulted, uh, assaulted um, Allison Stanger was ever actually charged with anything. So, and then of course we have the horror of Charlottesville, easily one of the most horrifying things I have seen in my career. So the temperature is going up a lot. So now I'm getting why people are paying more attention to this. It's getting pretty, uh, pretty scary. And then you see a phase, this is the most recent phase, um, what I would call sort of the backlash phase. This is when you have this sort of weird um, interaction between the uh, echo chamber of higher education and the echo chamber of sort of like the conservative media. We all, could, by the way, we all now live in uh, relatively thick echo chambers in communities that are more politically polarized than they were you know, 30, 40 years ago. And this is a case in which a professor uh, who wasn't even behind an event, went on Tucker Carlson, and she defended a party that was being thrown off campus that was for uh, black students only. And she went on because she didn't want some, some other person going on who couldn't defend it as well. And she basically just said, oh, poor white students are not invited to this party. We have every right to invite whoever we want. And she was fired after going on Tucker Carlson um, for this. Uh, so th these, are, these are some of the backlash cases we're seeing, including this professor from Princeton, um, who actually bowed out of a speech at Northwestern after rece receiving really horrifying death threats because she had made a speech that was uh, very critical of Donald Trump. So things are, <laughs> we're, this is a pretty dangerous combustible mixture we have going on here. Um, and at the same time, uh, one of the things that I see more on campus than off campus is just this idea that um, we need to give the government more power uh, to police speech. This has always struck me as mind boggling, particularly when I'm with my friends in San Francisco, when I have to explain it. So you understand what you're saying is you think the Trump administration should have more power to police speech they don't like. And they just always assume it's going to be enforced by someone that they, they agree with. And it's just, it's a very difficult argument to understand. But I'm going to talk about, the, so the conclusion, uh, what I mean by that is that all of these trends, none of them have stopped. <laughs> I'm still dealing with administrative cases. I'm still dealing with uh, cases of uh, student-led censorship. I'm still dealing with cases uh, involving the abuse of Title IX. I'm still dealing with cases um, that, that are similar to all these, and then some that don't even fit any narrative at all. But I wanted to give you at least some good news. Speech codes have decreased on campus by a lot. Um, they're actually, this is the 2017 report. Uh, so I told you it was 75% when we first started doing um, our study of it. It's now down actually to 31% um, in, the, in the last year, which is, which is great. And that's due to, frankly, a ton of lawsuits, not just by FIRE, but by other organizations. So that's, that's good news. The not so good news is that you have a lot of incidents that look just like the cases we've seen in the past. This is the Brett Weinstein case at Evergreen State University. Um, that was definitely, if you, if you, I can't cover all of that in one sitting. We just did a podcast with them uh, at thefire.org. You can check it out. It's kind of an amazing case. Um, then, there, you know, like, as I said, there are cases that just don't fit anyone's narrative. Um, and FIRE is, of course, fighting these all the time. This is Northern Michigan University. Um, they had a policy of threatening students with punishment if they were, uh, if they'd gone to the counseling center, they would receive a scary letter from the university uh, the disciplinary office saying, hi, we heard that you went to the counseling center. Um, by the way, if you talk about ideas of self-harm with any of your, uh, any of your friends, um, you can face serious punishment for that. Let that think, <laughs> sink in. Someone is telling someone, possibly who is depressed, oh, by the way, um, don't be a burden on your friends and isolate yourself, okay? That's insane. You, you need to actually look these things up um, to, to know that that's not good advice to give someone who's depressed. We understand that they're worried about the idea of contagion. This is not the way you, you handle that. And this is much more coldly deployed out of fear of litigation, uh, in, in our opinion. Uh, we managed to get this policy dismantled, which uh, it's, it still, it fits nobody's political narrative. And now we're sort of, everything is, everything old is new again. As Stanley can well attest, a lot of the first First Amendment cases um, that were the, the, in which there was a strong interpretation of free speech under the First Amendment uh, were cases involving um, people who were anti-capitalists, who were anarchists, who were Bolsheviks. And we, the, we're just in litigation right now for a student who was arrested at Joliet Junior College in Illinois for trying to hand out anti-capitalist flyers, arrested for 
it. We could hardly, we could hardly believe uh, that just trying to find out flyers, it would reach the point where we're sufficiently uh, far away from a, a strong idea of free speech that this, you know, this barely made any headlines. It didn't fit people's narrative. People didn't quite get it. And meanwhile, we're litigating this case for obvious wrong, um, unambiguously protected um, at, a, at a public college. And, and because it doesn't quite fit the existing narrative, people aren't paying attention. So he, that's my, my short history of free speech on college campuses. Um, here is my uh, contact information. Here's my um, uh, Twitter information. Uh, always feel free to uh, shoot me an email. Um, I always have uh, fun uh, talking with, uh, uh, with Stanley. And uh, at that, I'll, I'll give it over to Stanley. Uh, good afternoon. I always like to hear Greg's red meat speeches, uh, you know, the, otherwise known as, as, as the fire stump speech. Um, it's truly inspiring and depressing uh, at the same time. Uh, I can't say that I'm going to lower the temperature, uh, but rather I'm going to switch to perhaps uh, a more analytic and pro professorial mood. Uh, Greg and I don't disagree on many things. In fact, we agree on more things than we disagree with. But I thought I'd just give you one, in, one indication of where we might disagree. I, too, wrote about the guy who said, anyone uh, who can blow up the Pentagon has my vote. Do you remember when he said that or in what context? In a classroom. In a classroom on September 11th. Th then he should have been fired uh, <laughs> immediately uh, because he was then engaging in political activity in the context of a classroom uh, space which was paid for by the state or, or by the trustees of a private college. Uh, and so he had turned the classroom into a theater for his political views. And that just crosses a line. When you do that, you're no longer an academic agent. Uh, you have become something else, a political agent, and therefore you deserve no protection of any kind. So that just uh, sets a parameter that we might uh, later discuss. Debates about freedom of speech often proceed without any inquiry into what exactly speech is and why we might be committed either to promoting it or constraining it. This is a large question or set of questions and I won't be able fully to answer it today, but I can make a beginning by recalling for you some of the observations Thomas Hobbes makes about speech in his great book, Leviathan. Hobbes says two things which are in tension with one another. Early on, he says, and here he follows a very long philosophical tradition, he says that the capacity for speech is what distinguishes us from animals. Human and animals, he goes on, quote, share the senses and the natural instincts, but by the help of speech, these shared faculties may be improved to such a height as to distinguish men from all other living creatures, unquote. However, when later in the Leviathan, Hobbes returns to speech, he identifies speech as a capacity that enables us to be duplicitous, deceptive, destructive, and even evil. Then he says, although, our, although other creatures have some use of voice, I am quoting him, yet they lack that art of words by which men can represent to others that which is good in the likeness of evil and represent evil in the likeness of good. So speech as a capacity and as a form of action is a leading character in two narratives. In one narrative originated by Cicero and other classical humanists, speech is the deliverer of civilization. It's the faculty that allows us to formulate plans, recommend policies, urge actions, rise to life's challenges, coordinate our efforts to better the human condition. In the other narrative, a negative one, speech is the medium through which we deceive our wives and husbands, manipulate our fellow citizens, betray our civic missions, incite violence against our so-called enemies, and in general, do the work of the devil. The thing about these two narratives about speech is that they are both true, which is why we have two contrasting attitudes toward the production of speech enshrined in our laws. From the very beginning to this day, freedom of speech has been a double-edged concept, at once promising liberation and also delivering suffering 
in the form of humiliations, slanders, and even holocausts. Without free speech, it is said, life is cramped and claustrophobic. But it is also said that with free speech, deceptions small and large, and even tyranny, are just always around the corner. Now, the double-edged status of free speech is reflected in First Amendment law, which alternately labors to increase the amount of free speech available to citizens, but also to constrain some forms of speech, like pornography or hate speech, when it is thought that they marginalize and impugn the dignity of those same citizens. Free speech purists, essentially libertarians, will resist any constraints on speech, even when there is evidence that the effects of speech are pernicious rather than beneficial. These purists will say that the inconveniences and even harms produced by free speech are a small price to pay for the good effects of allowing speech to flourish. These purists will then point to the marketplace of ideas as a location or forum in which speech of all kinds is voiced, but the separating of the good from the bad speech is left to time and to the impersonal judgment of the market. I absolutely hate the marketplace of ideas uh, metaphor. It is silly. It doesn't bear up uh, on the slightest uh, examination. And besides, although I've asked many times, no one has ever been able to direct me to the marketplace of ideas. <laughs> but let's put that by for a moment. And let me focus on, on, on the very notion of a free speech regime that is without constraint. This is, of course, the standard story of free speech, a story that assumes that speaking freely is the natural or default condition, while limits on speech are artificial, politic, political, and suspect. In this story, the Ur or basic model of speech is the Hyde Park Corner a place dedicated to the production of speech that is insulated from both seriousness and consequences. People get up on a soapbox or stand on a street corner and have their say about anything, subject to no constraint except perhaps the constraint of time, for after all, everyone should have a turn at having his or her say. In fact, however, that standard story has it backwards. Hyde Park corners and other free speech zones are not the central or basic condition of speech. They are derivative. And what they are derivative from are all those contexts in which speech is being produced because something is at stake. When speech is uttered within an understanding of the concerns it might be addressing, the structure of those concerns serves as a constraint, a prior constraint, determining silently without any fuss, which assertions are relevant and which irrelevant, or frivolous, or out of bounds, or even illegal. That constraint, the mocking out in advance of the acceptable and unacceptable, is not added to or imposed on the scene of expression. It gives the scene of expression its shape and tells those who participate it what they can and cannot or should not say. As long as there's something at stake, as long as speech is more than noise indifferently produced, there is no such thing as free speech. If this sounds counterintuitive, try to think, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I, let me, no. free speech then, at least in my argument, is the outlier case. Constrained speech is the norm. Limitations on speech are part and parcel of any context in which speech is produced for a reason and not just for amusement. And that means that censorship in the form of it goes without saying restrictions on expression, censorship is built into ordinary occasions of speech production. It might seem odd to say so, but censorship precedes free speech. Censorship comes before free speech. If there were no censorship in the form of institutional purposes and goals that mock out what is appropriate and inappropriate to say, there would be no speech that was meaningful. You just have a lot of babble, which is what all of those apostles of the internet uh, with their silly slogans like information wants to be free, uh, finally uh, desire. 
speech that is so democratic that none of it means anything to anyone. Now, if all of this sounds counterintuitive, try to think of a situation in which you can say anything that comes into your pretty little head. It's not that easy. Used to be the case that fans at a football stadium or baseball game could speak or shout freely, but recently those fans have been ushered out of the stadium when what they were saying was deemed to fall into the category of fighting words. And of course, an employer has every right to fire you if he judges your speech or your clothing to be disruptive of the workplace, or if he doesn't want his business to be associated with people who express your kind of views. You don't even have to espouse those views in the office in order to be shown the door. Some of those who marched on the alt-right side in Charlottesville were terminated when their employers learned what they had been up to. They, of course, had the right to demonstrate and to carry placards and to shout, Jews will not replace us. But that right did not protect them from being penalized when they exercised it. And you all know the case of the Google employee who was let go after he sent out an internal memo criticizing the company's diversity differences and suggesting that gender imbalance in the workplace workplace might well be explained by natural differences between men and women. I guess he didn't get the memo issued by history announcing that this opinion is no longer one you're supposed to have. Freedom of speech is a right we have against government's efforts to suppress it, not a right to speak freely on any occasion. Many would say, however, that the case is quite different if the venue is not a commercial enterprise or a large corporation like Google, but a college or a university. After all, isn't the flourishing and protecting of free speech the very purpose of a university? The answer is no. It has nothing to do with the university. The answer is no, although many would answer yes. And among them, student protesters at Florida International University, who in a conversation with the university's president, complained that the university had established a free speech zone and did not recognize, as perhaps Greg would want them to recognize, that the entire university is, or should be, a free speech zone. Now the students might be pardoned for thinking so, given that in 2016, a committee of the University of Minnesota's Faculty Senate issue a statement, issued a statement entitled Free Speech at the University of Minnesota. Here are some of the key statements made by that committee. A public university, all of these statements are false. A public university must be absolutely committed to protecting free speech, both for constitutional and academic reasons. Two, no member of the university community has the right to prevent expression. And three, even when protecting free speech conflicts with other important university values, free speech must be paramount, must be paramount. All of that is arrant nonsense. Let's take the last one first. That is, even when protecting free speech conflicts with other university values, free speech must be paramount. Now, if this were so, then the instructor who cuts off a student in mid-sentence and says, quote, that's not an argument we'll pursue here, uh, is defaulting on his proper academic duties. By the same reasoning, the Minnesota reasoning, the department that mandates a particular set of texts as the one to be studied in a core course and disallows departures from that official list is violating the academic rights of an instructor who would prefer another list or prefer no list at all. And by the same reasoning, a department that rejected a faculty member's proposal for a new course on the grounds that it did not fit with the department's priorities would be stifling that faculty member's free speech. Not to mention the department that refused to hire or promote a candidate because his or her views were deemed insubstantial or below our standards. Surely, according to the University of Minnesota Senate Committee, this would be an impermissible silencing of an alternative voice. Now, of course, all of these examples are obviously absurd and intended to be so. For singly and together, they amount to a misunderstanding of what goes on in a university, which is not the proliferation of voices uh, by some resonant and self-gratulatory democratic principle. 
What goes on in the university is the continual judgment by persons and bodies authorized to judge that some voices are worthy to be heard, while others are to be sent away and silenced. Far from being the case, as the Minnesota statement says, that no member of the university community has the right to prevent expression, it is the very job of many members of university communities to prevent expression, to tell some people, among them students and faculty, you're not going to be allowed to speak, go away. It cannot be the case that a public university is, quote, absolutely committed to protecting free speech, unquote. What the university, Minnesota or any other, is absolutely committed to is the advance of knowledge through an inquiry into the truth of a matter, whether that matter be literary, philosophical, historical, sociological, anthropological, and so forth and so on. The university, this one or any other, is not in the business of protecting speech, but in the business of excluding speech, its procedures judge unworthy. So that the basic distinction is a distinction between freedom of speech on the one hand and freedom of inquiry on the other. They are not the same thing. In fact, in many ways, they, they are opposed. When the protesting students at FAU met with the president, they declared that only a university which was one large free speech zone is, quote, conducive to democracy. That might be right if the university were a democracy, but it isn't. So I don't see even the point of the statement. It is true, as the FIU students went on to say, that as citizens of the US, we need not apply for a permit to speak. The First Amendment should be our only permit because we are all equal people. Yes, they were and are, if the criterion for speaking is citizenship. For it is a cornerstone of our democratic principles that citizens no matter what their economic or educational status or political affiliations or religious commitments, have an equal right to speak out on matters of public concern or even matters of public, private concern. But that cannot be the core principle of a university where the main obligation is to inquire into the present state of our knowledge in a field and then to supplement or challenge that state in the hope of arriving at a better and more accurate account of the subject of hand. Obviously, there is nothing democratic about the course of this inquiry. It is, in fact, better described as Darwinian, the survival, if not of the fittest, at least the survival of those who are still standing after all the votes have been taken and the, all the evidence has stood the test of rigorous examination or failed to do so. The conclusion is one that I have already anticipated uh, and is, in fact, the title of this little piece, Freedom of Speech is Not an Academic Value. And I would add to that, there are no free speech issues on campus, which is <laughs> going to sound to you absolutely nuts. But let's see. All right. Completeness, so freedom of speech is not an academic value. Completeness of speech is an academic value. You shouldn't leave out evidence that counts against your case. Relevance of speech is an academic value. You shouldn't go off on tangents either in the classroom or in your scholarship. Each of these values is directly related to academic inquiry and to its goal of getting a matter of fact right. Now, of course, in the current scene, as Greg has pointed out, debates about free speech occur in the context not of classroom activities or even scholarly production, but in the context of extracurricular activities. Extra, as you all know, means outside of, or not integral to, or detached from. Extra also means that the activities that fall under that rubric are not essential to the university's mission and could be dispensed with. A college or university that just had students, faculty, a library, laboratories, and a computing center would be a university. Even if there were no student union, no food court, no athletic events, no auditoriums for visiting speakers, no bowling alley, no gymnasium with a swimming pool, and no climbing walls. If, however, the things that I have just listed were present in a space, but students, faculty members, and libraries were not, what you would have is not a university or a college, but a playground or at most a theme park. So colleges and universities are not under any obligation to include all these extras. 
although political and economic realities pretty much dictate that they must have some of them in order to attract a sufficient number of students. I taught for 11 years at a college, university, Johns Hopkins University, that had none of them, and it was the best place uh, that I've ever seen. But here's where the trouble begins. How does the university administration determine what events shall be authorized and what events shall be turned away if it decides to allow the extracurricular circus to come to town? And if an event has been authorized by the proper administrative procedures, how then does that same administration deal with the possibility of disruption and even violence? These questions, asked by every administration these days, sound as if they were deep questions, that is, related to significant moral and philosophical issues. They are not. They are merely questions of crowd control. Remember, the university is not presiding over extracurricular occasions in the same way as it presides over its classroom or its laboratories. The university may believe that the, these uses, these extracurricular uses, enhance the undergraduate experience or provide uh, interesting perspectives. But of course, that will be so only in a limited number of cases. Rock band concerts and visiting provocateurs are in the entertainment, not in the education business. In fact, in my mind, all extracurricular activities fall into the category of entertainment. And once that is understood, uh, uh, and once that is understood, let me see, oh yeah, the obligation of the administration uh, comes, uh, comes into focus. The obligation is to invite those in who are in fact likely to entertain including entertaining in the mode of provocation. But you should take care that the entertainment doesn't get out of hand and lead to the destruction of the very facilities that will welcome another form of entertainment next week. The show must go on, okay? So that, that, that's, 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 that's the whole thing. What you want is an experience that is stimulating, but not too stimulating, Voices and hands may be raised, but no blows landed. No one should be bored, and everyone should leave thinking, I had a really good time. The problem is that in the current campus atmosphere, assuring that happy outcome can cost a fortune. UC Berkeley spent over $600,000, it is reported, to, in an effort to keep the peace during a lecture given by one speaker. Is a university required to risk bankruptcy in order to avoid being found guilty of what is called in the law viewpoint discrimination? Now, Robert Post, former dean of the Yale Law School, would say that that is the wrong question. The right one, he explains, is does this event or speaker contribute to the university's mission of research and education? That's his question. This means, he explains, that speakers should be invited only because they serve these missions. And when they do not, failing to invite them or revoking an invitation too hastily tendered should raise no First Amendment issues because educational, not First Amendment values should be paramount. So in both cases, and in the classroom, in the laboratory, there are no free speech issues. In extracurricular activities, there are no free speech issues. Post neatly sidesteps the charge of viewpoint discrimination because what he is discriminating against is not a point of view as such, but a point of view that does not mesh with the purposes of the institution. Non-meshing is a judgment that might be applied to speech on any side of the political cultural divide. The point is not what the speech says, but whether what it says is helpful to the educational process as it has been judged to be so or not so by the administration. Therefore, administrators needn't tie themselves in knots over First Amendment issues. They should just forget about the friggin' First Amendment. They should just remember the mission of the institution they preside over and say yes or no to speakers without any free speech anxiety. And that will be debatable. Here's my little list. Richard Spencer, no. Charles Murray, yes. <laughs> David Duke, no. Betsy DeVos, absolutely. Donald Trump, a hard question. <laughs> so, administrators facing disruptions over extracurricular events can, I think, do one of three things. One, don't have any extracurricular events. <laughs> Two, 
If you decide to have them, make sure that you have a crowd control plan in place and the resources to implement. Or three, invoke Robert Post's test question, does it further the university's mission? And just say no to those events that are likely to be more theatrical than educational. Final point, if I can turn the page. I have ignored so far what might be considered the most pressing question to which Greg spoke. Why is it that student pro protests now take the form of hooting down speakers whose views they reject, sometimes hurling objects at them and refusing to engage with them at all? The answer is that rather than conceiving of themselves as participants in the university's core activity, separating the true from the false, many of today's students' protesters are persuaded that they already know what is true and what is false, and therefore believe that they are under no obligation whatsoever to listen to views they have already labeled as beyond their pale. The partnership, the, uh, the partnership of faculty and students in the search for knowledge has been abandoned by these students in favor of a righteousness that is finally more subversive of the academic spirit than the external constituencies that have traditionally attempted to subvert it. Once one understands, once one understands student protests as the expression of a theology rooted in the conviction of virtue, and therefore in the conviction that there is nothing really to learn, key terms and slogans begin to make a distressing sense. I refer, of course, to safe spaces, microaggressions, cultural appropriations, uh, trigger warnings, no platforming, etc. What is that students wish to be safe from? Ideas and perspectives that run counter what to, the, to what they already believe. In short, they don't want to learn. What is a trigger warning? A warning by an instructor to students that they may not like what they're about to hear or read, and therefore have the right to avoid it by not reading or not listening. They want to learn. In other words, they don't want to learn. What is a microaggression? Mistakes wholly unavoidable made by those who speak from a culture from one culture to others who inhabit another culture. Because they are unavoidable, microaggressions amount to a game of gotcha. For there will always be something to say, you say, that offends someone, and according to the logic of virtue, you deserve to be condemned for saying it. You're just not pure enough, okay? Now, the instructor might, who, who resolves to avoid microaggression uh, entirely had best just keep his or mouth, his or her mouth shut and say nothing, or say only what is expected, which is what the virtue besotted students really want. And as for cultural appropriation, the idea that a culture owns a form of music or a mode of dress or a style of cooking is racism pure and simple. Racism for it makes sense only if those modes and styles have their source in blood. And by this reasoning, arguing that some, uh, arguing that certain forms of ethnic music shouldn't be performed by white persons is the same as arguing that certain uh, ethnic populations lack intelligence. They're exactly the same, exactly the same arguments. Uh, if, in fact, if, 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 in fact, these modes and styles of performance have their source in a culture, as they surely do, then anyone who takes the time to enter and become a member of that culture has as much right to the clothing or music or food as anyone else. Steve Martin had a wonderful movie on this topic called The Jerk many years ago. Okay, last sentence. Oh, all right. This stuff... All of it, microaggressions, trigger warnings, cultural appropriations, safe spaces, just shouldn't be taken seriously. And the fact that it is is unhappy evidence that university administrators have lost sight of what their mission truly is. For were administrators to keep their eye on that mission, they would receive requests for trigger warnings and safe spaces and complaints against microaggressions and cultural appropriations with patience and then send the protesters away with a smile and with good wishes and with nothing else. Thank you. Thank you, Stanley. 
So we now have a short time available to us for um, discussion between uh, the debaters. And uh, after that, we'll open up the discussion to the audience. Um, let me start with a question um, for Greg, but then uh, Stanley may chime in. Um, so Stanley's proposed a, uh, a standard by which uh, we can judge the appropriateness of uh, visiting speakers, which is to say, do they or do they not contribute to the academic mission of a university? If they do, bring them in. If not, we don't. Uh, but the point isn't viewpoint diversity, right? The point isn't uh, or viewpoint neutrality. The point is always in reference to the higher mission of the university. Right. What do you think of that, Greg? Um, it, it, it's, I, I found this book kind of a peculiar argument to be hearing, partially because it's such an old-fashioned argument. Um, it is a, you know, it, it, it is what the protesters, uh, it, it, a lot of times people misunderstand the free speech movement um, coming out of Berkeley. And really the argument was against people who wanted, um, it was for pro-free speech people who wanted politics and they wanted to be able to agitate on campus. They wanted to be able to talk about causes they believed in. Now I'm on their side on this, but you don't really hear a lot of times what the other side of it was. This should be a place above and outside of politics. This should be a place that is basically like a monastery where we take ideas seriously. Now, the problem with this model is, um, and as Stanley often does and so does Post, is it gives way too much credit to academics to make decisions where they're not actually imposing their own point of view on who should be allowed to speak on campus. So that's why I'm with the, 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 the um, students in the free speech movements uh, after, the 19, uh, after the 1960s. And what would happen um, if you actually said, we're going to basically let, leave this up to academic decisions about who can be allowed to speak on campus, it's going to start looking an awful lot like the existing political bias of that actual campus, that people they like will be allowed to speak even if they're, and this is something that John Stuart Mill always saw coming. It's like, be very careful about civility arguments, he, he argued in 1859. Um, interestingly, a lot of people get this wrong about Mill. They think he was arguing against um, legal restrictions on speech. He he was actually arguing against uh, cultural norms and uh, oppressive uh, conformist uh, society. And he said, be very careful about civility concerns because it sounds all well and good, but guess what? As a practical matter, what ends up happening is that when I'm angry and I'm with the majority of, of, of the professors on my campus, my rage is righteous and my tongue is, is, is kissed with fire. But if you're slightly, if you're pretty adamant about what you believe and it's not what the rest of us believe, well, that's uncivil. And, that's, and that is one of the things about, about human bias, is that essentially one of the reasons why viewpoint discrimination, why I think um, the, uh, the way we interpret First Amendment law in America is so brilliant, is that it actually is we're also very good evolutionary psychologists. We're realizing how self-deceived we are and how prone we are to actually figure out some excuse for this speaker I don't like should not be uh, uh, should not be allowed on campus. So I think this is one of the reasons why we sort of did away with all this. Now, as to the <laughs> assertion that universities should stop concerning themselves with First Amendment, um, to tell that to a university general counsel or someone in the state of California, I mean, whether they like it or not, they have to. Now, I personally think that First Amendment law makes a great deal of sense. I think it's the best thought out philosophical approach to how you have a diversity of point of views in the real world. So a lot of what Stanley was talking about, it sounds very kind of like interesting and dazzling, but it's standard First Amendment law. It's stuff you sometimes cover in the first couple of weeks of a First Amendment class. Not all speech is protected. Now, the big difference between me and Stanley is I'm with the Supreme Court in that I see academic freedom as a not fully overlapping bubble but, but uh, 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 with the First Amendment, but it's part of it. That, that basically the free speech rights on campus, uh, particularly at public colleges, are protected under a First Amendment idea of academic freedom. It's not the exact same thing as the First Amendment, but to me it's still related to freedom of speech. It just has different rules that apply. The courts have actually been pretty sensible at, at, at applying in common sense ways that don't lead to the ridiculous outcomes um, that uh, Robert Post sometimes writes about, um, that they actually show a lot of common sense in how you maintain a diversity of points of view. Now, the academy, if it's now actually gonna try to start arguing that, well, you know, we're gonna make up our mind about who should or should not be allowed to uh, 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 speak on campus, even if the students want it to, they run into the very real problem that, wait a second, maybe that's the only way I got the point of view of someone who uh, differed from the, uh, po the, the popular belief on campus, or the only way I got to hear from someone who actually exists in, God forbid, the real world. 
to actually come here and actually say something interesting. I know from, from my experience um, that some of my best experiences on, on campus was hearing from outside speakers, not necessarily from the speakers, uh, not, not necessarily from the professors themselves. And certainly some of my worst experiences on campus was sometimes hearing from the professors themselves. So Stanley, let me, let me ask you. Respond on that point. Please do. First of all, on academic freedom, of which I wrote a book, on which I wrote a book in 2000. Yeah, you need a microphone. Called, uh, called my 2014 book was entitled Versions of Academic Freedom. And one of the points that it made is that there's almost no law made on the basis of the doctrine of academic freedom. Uh, what happens in most cases, even the celebrated ones, is that some justice, Brandeis or Brennan or somebody, says something very noble sounding about academic freedom and then goes on to decide the case uh, as, a, as a tax matter uh, or as. Or, or as uh, as, as an employment uh, dispute. So I don't think that ac academic freedom in the Supreme Court records is rhetorically strong and legally weak. Mm -hmm. uh, and but that's not the same thing as saying it doesn't exist. It <laughs> okay. And if you want to play an interruption game, you lose. <laughs> okay. Now, I, was, uh, I happened to be uh, at Berkeley on the eve of the free speech movement. I was at my home and I turned on the radio and they're talking about things on campus. I was a faculty member there. I said to my wife, let's go down and see what's happening. And of course, I wasn't able to reach the campus because by then it was ring, uh, ringed around by police. Uh, events developed, they're historically documented. I don't have to tell you about them. But one of the things that happened is that many faculty members, especially many members of the English department, where English department members will do almost anything to avoid actually doing their jobs, uh, they, decided to, they, they decided to stay uh, away from their classes and make common cause uh, with the students. Uh, and I declined to do so and, and did one other faculty member, uh, out of a faculty of about 107, uh, and declined to do so also. I taught my course uh, in late medieval allegory. Uh, you can't get more uh, uh, ivory tower uh, than that. Uh, and one of my students stood up and said, how can you be teaching this class when some of your students and maybe even your colleagues are being dragged down the steps of Sproul Hall? I said, in effect, I don't want you nominating my values, and I'm teaching these courses because I'm paid to do so. It's in the catalog. I wasn't trained and paid uh, to make political pronouncements or join political movements. I was going to, if I was going to save the world, again, it would be uh, on my own time. Now, Greg accuses me, uh, quite correctly, of offering a, an ivory tower view, although he didn't use that phrase, an ivory tower view of the university. I do. I think that the university is there uh, to, uh, uh, to operate exactly as uh, Aristotle explains it in the 10th book of his Ethics when he's talking about the activity of contemplation, which he describes as being closest to the activity of the gods. Uh, and he points out that in contemplation, you turn things around, and then you turn them around again, and then you ask someone else, a third or fourth party, to turn them around again. And what you don't do is move toward a conclusion that would lead to action. So in other words, in my view, the university should be entirely insulated and isolated from the real world, at least in that sense, and pursue its characteristic business, which is contemplation and disinterested um, activity. Now, I would say that, and, and Bob Post, Robert Post also says this, is that my point is that First Amendment law, as beautiful as it is, and I don't, not, I don't, I don't think it's that beautiful. That's a course I teach. First Amendment law is full of extraordinary incoherences, especially on the religion clause side, where there isn't a coherent page in the entire Supreme Court record. It's full of incoherences. Whatever it is, it has nothing to do, this is my point, it has nothing to do with what's going on in universities, because universities are not in the First Amendment business. They're in the education business. So you can say all the nice things you want about the First Amendment. It has no, uh, I think it has no pertinence uh, uh, to the argument. And finally, uh, the question that is raised by, uh, by Greg, which is a very serious question, is who is the old, this turns up again and again in First Amendment discussion, the old who is to judge question. Uh, if, uh, if, if one follows Bob Post's recommendation, which wasn't mine, I offered the three, I actually favor the second one, uh, which is uh, keep, um, keep uh, crowd control plans in place and uh, expel students as quickly as possible uh, when, there are, when there are violations 
of them. But nevertheless, the question who is the judge under Bob, Robert Post's uh, 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 plan uh, is a real one. And my answer to that question is very simple. The people who should be judging are the people who are paid to do the judging. That is, the people who are administering the universities. Now, if you have university administrators who can't detach that duty uh, from their partisan identification with one party or their partisan, partisan uh, disidentification with another, that's just too bad. But what that means is that you have bad university administrators. What's so unusual about that? 98% of the university administrators in this country or any other are bad at their job. <laughs> they haven't the slightest idea um, of what they're doing. But nevertheless, that's their job. And if I were president of the university, you wouldn't have to worry. I would be doing the job well. <laughs> Comforting words from Stanley Fish. Uh, I, just, I, I just have one serious question, and, I, um, and I'm curious about what you think about, um, and it's really just about um, pr professorial engagement with the outside world. When, when you talk about the ivory uh, tower model, the thing that I, I think that would be lost from that is partially, you know, I'm working on a, a book for popular consumption with a sociology professor, um, the, the psychology professor. Um, a lot of the things that I think that, I, that are my favorite things to read are the product of uh, professors writing for, for mass audience. But, but also sometimes when I watch you know, a program, some of the ones I like the most um, walk, uh, news programs is when they actually bring on an academic to talk about um, sometimes issues that aren't directly related to their area of expertise. How do you feel about outside engagement? Yeah, well, I used to be one of those cameo TV intellectuals <laughs> myself. I appeared on Hardball twice uh, on O'Reilly's show, Larry King and about uh, uh, 10 or 12 others. But I never would have put those on my resume uh, because they're not academic. I wrote a, I wrote a column uh, uh, intermittently and for seven years weekly, uh, 18 years altogether for the New York Times, over 300 columns. Um, but these were not part of my academic work. Uh, no doubt my academic work uh, uh, did uh, feed into those columns, but I wanted to keep that separate. Uh, so that if you have members of the academy who are also working in quote unquote uh, the real world uh, and they can still uh, maintain their academic responsibilities, that's okay. But just keep the two spheres of activity separate and don't trade on one, don't trade one uh, on the other. Uh, and there, there are a whole race of public intellectuals uh, who I think are trading on their, uh, on their, uh, public intellectual activities and on their uh, academic activities and trying to combine the two. Uh, one that comes to mind uh, most immediately is Steven Pinker. I don't think it works. <laughs> let, me, let me ask just one more question before we open this up to general discussion. So, Greg, one of your challenges to Stanley's uh, point about invited speakers was this who's to judge point, right? Yeah. Who's, if we give administrators the power to judge between those speakers that contribute to the academic mission of the university and those who don't, um, those administrators are going to use their power to make judgments in accordance with their political bias. Right. But what about an issue that seems on its surface anyways much simpler and much less subject to those biases, which is hate speech. Right. Mm -hmm. What possible value can hate speech add in a university con context, right? Such that it wouldn't be appropriate for administrators to ban the use of, say, racial epithets mm -hmm. um, or certain phrases that just aren't seem like they could only have the intention and purpose of causing emotional harm to other people. Sure. Now, well, the first thing I always have to say about hate speech is that there's a popular misunderstanding that one of the categories of unprotected speech under the First Amendment is hate speech. There is no such category. Um, it doesn't exist. Now, sometimes people will try to say, oh, there's the fighting words doctrine, uh, which I always find very funny because generally people who are trying to create a hate speech um, uh, exception are, are generally people who are not sympathetic to the idea that you can go to jail for calling a cop a fascist. That's the court case that the fighting word doctrine come from, is someone getting in trouble for calling a cop a fascist. I'm like, that's just our ironic beyond belief. That's not a, I don't actually don't think Chaplinsky is still good law, um, with the case that we're, that we're talking about, given it's just completely inconsistent with other decisions. Yeah, <laughs> one sentence, oh, yes, you're right, you're right. That, and that's why it does get cited an awful lot. Um, but uh, so hate speech. As a practical matter, um, if, you're in your if you're a professor in your class and we've, I don't know if we've ever really seen it, maybe we've seen maybe one or two case submissions or, or heard of something like this where someone berates racially a student. 
um, as a practical matter, you are going to be, uh, and correctly, you are going to be fired. <laughs> that is unprofessional, no uh, university, I can think of at least, would, would allow that kind of behavior. Um, however, what I have seen is the concept creep problem where people actually merely mention an epithet. I, there was a con the, I've seen a couple of the different cases, particularly in the last couple of years, where people actually talk about an epithet, usually talking about why it's considered a bad word and what its derivation is. And they've gotten in trouble because, it, because merely using the word was actually considered to be hate speech. Um, generally, it's, it ends up just not being as simple to figure out who the hate speaker is. Um, and given the concept creep we see on campuses, it becomes a very um, uh, a, you know, difficult uh, uh, concept to pin down. And I'm fully aware that at some point I'm going to end up being protested for being pro-free speech, even though I've defended people's right to, call, you know, to say whatever. And right now, the idea of expanding the power of, uh, of an administration um, to, or of the government or of a school to go after uh, speech because they dislike the viewpoint, in this case, we can argue that, that it's hateful, um, is gonna lead to some very bad unintended consequences and to the silencing of voices that might be perfectly uh, committed to a serious ivory tower uh, education. Well, I think you, Greg and I are, are, are clo very close. Uh, I would be even more severe on the category of hate speech. Hate speech is an unstable category. Uh, it's impossible to get a list of propositions which uh, are its content. Yep. Uh, that is, there would have to be prop a proposition or propositions which, when uttered, everyone um, would agree that it is hateful. There's no such set. And the reason why is that people who produce what you or I might call hate speech do not think of themselves as producing hate speech. They think of themselves as telling the truth. Uh, and then I would say the same of Holocaust denial. Holocaust deniers believe what they say, uh, and they believe that what is said by those who criticize them, uh, they believe that what is said by those who criticize them is hateful. So if I had to give a, de a definition of hate speech, it would be hate speech is speech vigorously uttered by people you are opposed to. That's, <laughs> that, that's hate speech. And that leads to the problem that uh, Greg uh, pointed to uh, in his remarks, that people now hear some statement uh, which is intended uh, by the person who makes it as a statement of fact or as a description or as an ob observation. And they say, well, that's hate speech. And then you ask them why, and they say, because uh, it implies that, when in fact it may or may not imply that, but it certainly is in hate speech. I think that hate speech is, finally, I would say, hate speech is finally not an interesting subject. <laughs> so I'm now going to do my best Phil Donahue impersonation and uh, run out of the audience to take uh, questions from any of you who have one. Yeah, I have, I have um, I'm trying to see how serious the disagreement is. I, I, actually, I actually think your two views are pretty compatible for mo over most topics. So let me give Greg the question that on which Stanley expressed a, an opinion about the professor who made political statements in a class. Yeah. Uh, and, and Stanley said, should be fired, right? He's, yep. he's, not, teach he's not teaching the class. He's, he's just giving his political views in a forum where that's not appropriate. And Stanley, I was gonna ask you, in, if the university decides not to be a purist, you know, uh, just a, a, a walled in uh, a sanctuary for academic pursuit, but instead allows, for example, student groups with some university funding to invite whatever the student, you know, whomever the student group uh, wants to invite, do you see um, free speech um, in its constitutional sense, however messy it is, and you and I agree about a lot of that, do you see that as appropriately applied in those cases where some student groups are allowed to invite their non-academic speaker and other student groups are not? So I'll just let Greg respond to the yeah, okay, you, you've got us. Um, we're both First Amendment people, um, so we actually, on a lot of stuff, we, we actually do agree. And the difference between me and uh, Stanley on the question of Richard Berthold, who is the person who had said, 
uh, anyone who could blow up the Pentagon as my vote, is uh, two questions. Um, one is uh, germaneness, and the other one is breathing room. So if you have an international, uh, germaneness and breathing room. Yeah, so germaneness is first, is it germane to the topic of the course? And so if you're teaching a class on international politics, um, there's, uh, there's a lot of area for you to actually be able to give your political opinion. You don't have to hide it. And there's actually an argument that in some cases being very upfront about your biases is better than trying to hide them. I don't always agree with that. I've been incredibly impressed by professors who you don't know what they actually think by the end of the class. I think that's really good teaching, but, that's, but I can also understand someone saying, listen, I'm biased on this, understand these things about me, and I'm gonna do my best to teach this. Now, so that's germaneness. Is it germane to the course? So the, the, the more, so if, the closer you get to the, the example of someone talking about their opinions on abortion in a physics class, the easier it gets. But there's also the breathing room issue which is essentially, I think professors all around the country spent some time talking about what happened in New York on 9-11, whether they're chemistry professors, physics professors, certainly politics professors, and I don't, and I don't think that given uh, those circumstances that, any, that all of them should be fired. But when someone does uh, depart and give their political point of view, as a practical matter, you have to allow some amount of breathing room around it. And, and, and that, because otherwise, that means if someone says, yeah, I was really upset about what happened in the election today, let's go talk about the ancient Greeks. Um, and the idea that someone could be fired for just mentioning briefly what they actually think on things and something where it's not perfectly germane is very much what, uh, what was one of the problems introduced by uh, what, uh, David Horowitz's um, Academic Bill of Rights. There were a lot of people who got behind this, uh, this conservative, in some cases, legislation with the idea that essentially you could play a game of gotcha to say, I can, I, I can uh, get this professor fired if they give their political opinion. Where I fall down is essentially you have to analyze it, uh, the, the, the full facts, figure out if it's germane, and if it's a substantial departure from the actual topic of the class, then there's not a lot we can do for you. But a single statement, we're, we're always going to have a professor's back if that's what they get fired for. Well, I would reply to Larry's question, but also first to yours. I disagree practically with everything you just said. So we're back on track. <laughs> you uh, disagree with Germanus? Yeah, I, yeah, and I certainly disagree with the idea that what you uh, uh, that you should uh, upfront tell students about your biases. That's just giving yourself a get out of jail or a free pass card. Huh. I can say anything I like because I've warned them about it. Now that's dishonest. Uh, what you want to do is make sure that the academic topic, which is the subject of discussion, is the one that you keep focused on in the classroom. Uh, there was a, a, a teacher by the name of Nell Boschenstein, uh, who teaches writing at Sweetbriar College. Um, and the day after Trump's election, uh, she went into this, her class, and here she reports the conundrum uh, that uh, uh, she uh, was experiencing. She says, quote, was I to walk into class Wednesday morning after the election uh, and, and say, I know we're all tired and feeling sensitive today, but let's turn to page 46 and pick up where we left off? My answer to that is, she should have just said, let's go to page 46 <laughs> and pick up where we left off and forget about this business, I know we're all tired and feeling sensitive today. She went on to, in fact, pick up the second of her options, which was to, as she put it, bring up the elephant in the room, and then was surprised that to find among her students were persons who were not distressed by the election <laughs> of Donald Trump, but who were pleased by the election of Donald Trump. And she then lectured them and questioned them, how could you think that way, and so forth and so on. That person should have been out of her job by the afternoon. That person just, that, that's absolutely, that's absolutely ridiculous. So you shouldn't try, you shouldn't, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't think that you have a pass to give your political views because you've told your students that you have them. Um, and uh, you should just stick to the subject matter at hand, which is not difficult. No matter what you're teaching, you just do it. Because anything that you're studying, whether it's a poem, piece of history, uh, anthropology, a chemical formula, uh, has a history and a tradition, and it's rich, and there are contested views in the in, in in the discipline. And you can teach those, and you will, in fact, not have have enough time in in, in uh, sixty minutes or ninety minutes to do even that. And that as 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 opposed to expressing your distress or joy uh, at at what's happened. Now, as as for your question, Larry, uh, I I think, in fact, if a university does decide that it's going to have uh, student-sponsored talks, which are um, 
to some extent, I mean, the funds, the, the amount of money is usually small, uh, but to a, some extent funded uh, out of student fees uh, and presided over by the administration, then it's quite likely that they fall under the uh, First Amendment's limited forum doctrine, uh, whereby once you, in fact, set up a forum in which people are invited uh, to, uh, 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 in which groups of students, students, groups that are in fact authorized by the university are uh, uh, told you can invite speakers under the following conditions of safety and so forth and so on, then you cannot choose between them. Then that would be the wrong way to choose between them. So I think that you and I would probably agree on that. Oh, and I just wanted to. Uh, oh, uh, let, I want to try to get a couple more questions. Oh, is it, can I say it real quick though? Just a, it's actually a point of agreement. Okay. When um uh when Stanley talks about uh, what what, he, uh, what I would describe Stanley talking about um is a decision on whether or not someone is representing the best ped pedagogical practices, and that's why. And for as far as fire is concerned, if a department decides that this professor was actually not being a good professor by constantly uh, putting in their their opinion, we're actually going to defer to uh to a decision by a department if they think someone's being a bad teacher, but usually it's the case when someone who's not actually an academic decides to impose, you're now fired for this, and then fire has to come in. Okay, well, thank you both for coming. Um, I think it's interesting that your um, organization's called FIRE, because I actually have a question about that. Sure. Um, if, you, if you shout fire yes. in a theater, I mean, you know, that's Absolutely. against the law, so... No, <laughs> that's actually not true. But, but okay, we're, we're, we're well, you know, it, like yeah. with incitement and things like that. I mean, if you if people die, I think that that's an no. issue. Okay, it, it's a it's a, it's a long story about fire and a car. Well, can you talk about that? Because there were a lot of posters that were put up, you know, on schools against you know people who are gay or people who are transgender, and if that incites violence, do you not think that those things on schools should be against the law? Uh huh. Okay, so the first point is the most abused metaphor in the history of law. Um, which is that you are not permitted to falsely shout fire in a crowded theater. It's generally misquoted as saying, well, well it's illegal to sh shout fire in a crowded theater, and that's just simply not true. Um, the, the, uh, it's actually been disproven in every single showing of the play Rosencrantz and Guildenstern Dead. They literally shout fire, and usually oftentimes in a crowded theater, and, they, and, they actually, and then they look back at each other and go, well, there goes that theory. <laughs> um, so it, it is an incredibly abused uh, term. It, it goes back to Oliver Wendell Holmes, who I actually, you know, I, I, I think he's a fascinating dude, but I think Stanley and I also agree that he gets much, much, much too much credit. Now, as to the idea of incitement, what we've actually reached is, and I agree with the law, that essentially incitement is a principle that you, uh, that incitement is when you're trying to get someone to do something with a, uh, that is imminently likely to happen. So it's not just saying, I think homosexuality is wrong, it's saying, let's go hurt this person. Um, and in a situation where it's, like, where it's likely to happen. That's the Brandenburg standard. So the, the, the fire in a shouted, uh, crowded theater has an incredible metaphorical uh, power. So if you're saying, if someone's saying things that are uh, homophobic, um, that are, uh, uh, as far as they're concerned in a lot of cases, they're expressing a religious uh, idea um, or they're expressing a hateful opinion. But as I said, that is actually protected. I haven't really found on campuses that that goes as if it's no big deal. In almost every one of these incidents, when you're dealing with someone like as bad as the Westboro Baptist Church, what ends up happening is the counter protesters outnumber the, the, the Westboro Baptist Church people by a factor of about 100 to one. So a lot of these scenarios, it, it, they seem to involve um, an idea that there's nothing we can do if someone actually says this word and someone is necessarily going to be immediately inspired to harm someone because of it. And that's, a, that's an incomplete uh, picture of the way a give and take in, a, in, in a, a university society or anywhere else actually works. But thank you. It depends on part whether you think that the First Amendment um, is a principle or a value. Um, that is, if it's a principle, uh, and, and it's often called a fundamental principle, if it's a fundamental principle, then that rhetoric, of, uh, that rhetoric suggests that it admits of few, if any, exceptions, and that it, and if you'll pardon the use of the word, that it trumps, uh, <laughs> that it trumps all. But if the First Amendment is a value, that is, it's a consideration, it's something that people think well of, uh, then uh, you might want to ask whether or not there are other values uh, in the situation which might balance or counterweigh it, and then you're into balancing, which all of the uh, First Amendment purist libertarians 
uh, dislike. You also have to acknowledge what Larry Alexander has uh, demonstrated in much of his work, that even if First Amendment uh, is a value rather than a principle, it's a different value in different contexts. And so it's very difficult uh, to say exactly what the value of the First Amendment um, is. The thing that I want to avoid is making the First Amendment into an alternative, an alternate rather, theology. Uh, that is one of the things that's happened in, a, in the history of American liberal thought, is that the dislodging of God and other sources of authority has resulted in the desire uh, to have a new God that we can institute, bow down, and worship. Uh, and that turns out to be, in many cases, the First Amendment. So the First Amendment is described as sacred, it's described as inviolable, uh, and all other kinds of uh, vocabularies uh, that go along with words like that. To which I want to say something very simple. If I want to worship a god, I want it to be God and not the First Amendment. <laughs> okay, uh, my question is, uh, I'm sure you'll agree that universities' first obligation is to educate their students to be prepared for the outside world. Now, I have trouble understanding why censorship of outside speakers do not get handled more, uh, with more authority. Why, when they have these demonstrations that result in violence, mm -hmm. why can't the president or the powers that be do something about it? It seems that nothing ever happens to the children out there that are, are violating the person, the speaker's right to speak. And my second question is, because I am a very action-oriented person, what can all of us do tomorrow outside of picketing to try and correct this problem that exists in the colleges today? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this is one of the reasons why I'm not so sympathetic to the argument, uh, actually I'm not sympathetic really at all, to the, to, to the argument uh, that uh, the University of California had to spend half a million dollars to protect conservative speakers when they came, is because yes, and they brought it on themselves. Um, and what I mean by this is, when the Milo riots happen, um, fire, you know, which can be char caricatured as being like an unthinking uh, organization, we actually were very cautious in what we said about it because our understanding was 1,500 people showed up and that the uh, cops felt overwhelmed and that even though a lot of the stuff was on, uh, was on video, that, that, that they just were overwhelmed and it was too dangerous a situation. We're like, listen, we're gonna wait till we find more information. We hope that the university does a serious investigation into it and people who engage in violence should be punished. They didn't do that. Um, that, that uh, and, and that's when you're, you're like, oh, guys, this is really dangerous. Like, we know what's going to happen next. Um, what's going to happen next is there's going to be incidents in the city of, of Berkeley. There's going to be incidents at Berkeley where unless you actually send a very strong message that we will be highly tolerant of uh, diverse viewpoints, but absolutely no tolerance for violence. Um, it, if you don't punish that severely, if you don't actually take a strong stand on that, that means you're essentially uh, giving the power to the heckler's veto. And if you watch what happened over the next several months, that's exactly what happened. So by the time they were, they were crying about having to pay half a million dollars, I'm like, well, did you arrest anybody for trying to kill people during a, during a riot? I agree entirely with that because uh, I remember the Middlebury College uh, incident, the president, Laura Patton, and some other members of the faculty said, we were surprised by the size and extent of the protest, to which I would say, well, that's your job. <laughs> you know, that's like administrating colleges and universities 101. <laughs> you know, you're, you're sitting around saying, I'm surprised. You know, it's like, uh, you know, I'm surprised, like, like a line from Casablanca uh, or, 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 uh, or something. It's not, it's their job that is administrators not to be surprised by things that happen on the campuses they supposedly administer. <laughs> Uh, but that goes to the second question that you put. What can all of us do? The answer is nothing. Uh, because that's, that's encouraging. <laughs> what happens or doesn't happen on universities, as Greg was suggesting in his response, depends on the strength and wisdom of the administration. If there were wise and strong administrators who acted in some of the ways that Greg was suggesting and in some other uh, related ways, uh, these incidents uh, would be first diminished 
uh, and uh, in time uh, discouraged. So you have to be, you have to have an administrator who really knows his or her mind and also knows the law and also uh, has a good office of legal counsel, which is not <laughs> as simple a matter as you might think. Right. As loath as I am to uh, bring this evening's conversation to a close, or this evening's entertainment, especially since we don't have a rock climbing wall here at USD to serve <laughs> as a substitute, uh, I think we have time for maybe just one more question before we, uh, we wrap things up. And I'll try to get a student here uh, in the back. One thing you can do, though, is don't mechanically give to your alma mater when they're doing things you don't like. An awful lot of people just do it automatically. <laughs> Uh, hey, so I'm Michael. Uh, I just wanted to ask a question to Stanley. So I, you can agree with me or not agree with me on the fact that I feel like <laughs> I don't have something to Stanley to you. Oh, try, try Professor Fisher. I'm tripping me off the door. Oh, my bad. I'll just call you Professor. I apologize, but <laughs> um, so Professor, uh, you could agree or disagree with me on this, but I think that one of the most important aspects of growth for a student is intellectual discourse, whether it's with other students or professors. So I think my question comes with where do we draw the line between academic discourse and then just not tolerated speech? Because I feel like we should err on the side of freedom in the fact that if we can't, if people start holding back different opinions, we lose that ability to have academic discourse. So where do you think is the line? Because I would argue that I don't think there is any line. It's either well, there is or there isn't. I, I would uh, seize captiously on the word opinions in your question. I don't think that opinions have anything to do with it. What goes on in university classrooms and in research uh, laboratories uh, or in conferences that might take place in a university, uh, in, in a university uh, setting are not the giving opinions, but the giving of reasoned views on the basis of, uh, of evidence, uh, credentials, historical knowledge, and so forth and so on. So I make my same old tired point. If you stick to that, if you stick to that extraordinarily demanding notion of what university is like, university work and life is like, that is the deliberative examination of points of view and traditions and histories with a view to getting them accurately uh, 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 described. If you stick to that, you will not be producing opinions. And if you stick to that, uh, you will not in fact uh, be troubled by any issues uh, of free speech. So uh, may your life, this is kind of a, uh, kind of a, a Spock benediction, uh, may your life be not only fruitful, but free of free speech controversies. Uh, just that I think Steve Pinker's, uh, Steve Pinker's fantastic and writes awesome books. That's it. All right. Thanks to all of you for coming out tonight. Uh, as a reminder, thanks, thanks to our, our guests here, Greg Leon and Sam Fish. As a reminder, please take some time to fill out our survey if you get a chance. We, uh, we run an annual debate series. We try to hold one debate in the spring and one debate in the fall. So we look forward to seeing some of you out here next year for our fall debate.